growing up from the very beginning, you were athletic. That's correct. Looking back on those days, what were some of the things that you participated in and accomplished and ran in? Well, I started out in age group swimming here at the Anderson Swim Center (laughs) there on 81, and that was where I first started. And then from there, I started running 5Ks and and longer distances and um, eventually got into track and field, competed in the 100, the 200, and the long jump. After I got a little bit slower, I decided to uh, return to my long distance uh, routes and, and have run a number of 5Ks, 10Ks, done some triathlons, and I've run two marathons. At your age now, you're still a young buck, but wh- <laughs> what do you do now to still stay in shape? I, I still run a couple of times a week. I bike or stationary bike a couple of times a week. I swim and then I also exercise with weights, you know, so hopefully getting some type of exercise in about five days a week. If you don't stay active, you don't have a chance of maintaining a good quality of life as you get older. So you got to stay active. The challenge when you're older, right? You know, if you're used to doing something when you're 25 or 35 or, or, or 45, you're used to doing certain prowess, right? Uh, and then as you get into your 50s, um, you know, your body doesn't want to cooperate with those expectations, but you've got to continue to try. And you got to realize, you know, C plus workouts better than no workout. You know, and so it's, it's about adapting and, and changing your expectations uh, and changing what uh, your level of success or your metric for success is. And then some days it's just getting in a workout, you know, um, but that's, it's, it's critical to stay active, to stay moving. Um, if something hurts, that probably means you're doing something good for yourself. <laughs> You were born on a farm that everybody that is in Anderson County and has traveled Concord Road knows it's the Martin Farm out there with the three or four big blue silos. That's That's where you grew up. I grew up there, yes, absolutely. When I was a year old, my father had an accident on that farm. He was working with the feed wagon, trying to get it unclogged, and I got too close to some of the moving parts and was and was his um, his right leg was pulled into it um, and he uh, eventually had an amputation below the knee uh, after that accident he was tough as a pine knot I mean he worked on crutches you know before his limb even healed up he was back on the tractors uh, driving with crutches uh, he t- would tell me he would operate you know the brake with the crutch pushing it down you know and operate the clutch with his with his left leg so uh, he didn't stop I have a lot of admiration for all the hard work he did on on one amputate you know on an amputation I did work on the farm I worked on his farm I also helped on my grandfather's farm on the Walker side over on Liberty Highway yeah. and then you're eight years old yes and your whole world flips upside down Absolutely. What happened? Well, I was helping my grandfather on his farm in 1975. It was uh, not such a great tractor. It was, uh, uh, the, had to ride on the back because one of the fenders was missing, you know, typical of South Carolina farmers. Um, and I fell off the back of the tractor onto uh, the power takeoff shaft. And the power takeoff shaft was spinning. Um, it snagged my pants leg and had a winding injury, basically pulled my leg into the shaft and, and, and wound it around it. Eventually, about 10 surgeries later, I was an amputee. You know, I lost my leg to that accident. So it was a long, long time in the hospital. They tried to save my limb for probably about, you know, half of those surgeries and half, you know, in about a month and then eventually there's really not enough skin or viable tissue to save it. And that's typically the case in traumatic cases. Amputation level is often dictated by soft tissue, skin coverage, not necessarily bone or muscle, but the the skin wasn't wasn't viable. So I had the amputation as a knee disarticulation or through the knee amputation. Eight years old. At eight years old, yeah. You cannot go through a traumatic accident where your life is turned upside down from any expectation you had at that young of an age. You, you, you can't go through that without some kind of um, emotional trauma and uh, depression. But you get over it as time goes on, you understand this is your new life and you get over it. And certainly both of my parents were loving and supportive. 
as well as toe the line. You know, there's gonna be certain expectations. You're still gonna have to pull your weight on the, around the house. You're still gonna have to pull your weight around the farm. And, you know, um, it's a journey. You know, there's not a, there's not a, a switch that you flip and all of a sudden you're, you know, um, emotionally over that amputation or, or um, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a process, you know. You didn't um, get a pass. Oh, absolutely. There's no pass. <laughs> no pass on a Martin's house household. No, sir. <laughs> my right leg, my sound limb, was injured significantly. My ankle was broken. The tib and the fib were broken. So that took a long time to heal, as well as be comfortable to bear weight. So, so that, that was a process. I was in a wheelchair for a while while that was healing, you know, and then eventually was uh, adept at crutches, and then you get your prostheses and you go from two crutches to one crutch, from one crutch to a cane, and then you finally throw it away and you don't need anything. When I'm working with folks, that's the first thing I tell them. This is a process, and it's, it's not a race, you know, to see how quickly you can get there, it's to see how well you can get there. When you get there, it's a pretty sweet feeling. I started swimming, age group swimming, after my accident. For, with one leg. Correct, for correct. So I started swimming actually Shepherd Swim Center yep. down here on 81 had a disabled rehab swimming program, you know, so I started doing that for exercise and they said, you need to be on the swim team, you know, and so I went into age group swimming right after that. So um, that was swimming in the pool without my prostheses. Um, you know, then I started, uh, like any kid would do, you know, we, we played pickup sports. From a social standpoint, say when you get to Hannah, you're a good looking guy. How does how does the fact that, you know, you've got one real leg and one artificial leg come into play when it comes to a social life? Well, you know, when we're young we're always trying to get our mojo, right? And and figure out where we're gonna fit in, into that. And you know, it's probably fair to say there there was doubt here and there, but it really was not a factor, you know did have some dates in high school and, and a girlfriend or two um, and the fact that I was an amputee was 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 not an issue. What about a um, Furman? Uh, it was not an issue either there. I uh, went to Furman. Folks were very receptive of, of people with disabilities and, and my amputation and it was not an issue when it came time to to, to meet girls and, uh, and, and my wife whom I've been married to for 34 years. When you were at Furman, did you know what you wanted to major in? No, I did not. You know, like a lot of folks, I went there pre-med and the rigors of the pre-med curriculum, and I did not g haw too well. Uh, and then I changed to accounting and business, and I actually graduated Furman with a business degree and was a corporate banker for four years. I knew probably a couple of years into my banking career that that wasn't where I needed to be long term for, for a number of reasons. I like to work with people with a lot of autonomy. I like working with my hands. Started looking at the field of prosthetics and, and I went back to prosthetic school. Where? I went to Florida International University down in Miami, Florida. I had started actually volunteering or working for free at the uh, prosthetic clinic at which I was a patient in Greenville, as well as taking, you know, I had a few holes in my curriculum. I needed to take some physiology and an anatomy class, so I took that at night um, and then got accepted and, and we, we moved to sunny Miami for a couple of years to finish my prosthetics degree. I felt comfortable the day I resigned from the bank that this is the route I was going. There was no turning back. I knew this was what I wanted to do. This is where I wanted to be. I was locked in on a mission on that, so there, there was never a doubt on that. It's certainly not uncommon to find practitioners who are amputees or who were led to the field by their own personal experience. That, that's not uncommon. That being said, I don't think, you know, in the state of South Carolina, there's probably, I don't know, maybe four or five uh, of the 100 or 130 practitioners that are, you know, are amputees as well. And I mean, it's fulfilling, really, because you've already be. gone down, you've already had that journey, you've already gone down that road, and you can look at somebody and say, listen, you know, it, it stinks right now, it's heavy right now, and, and it's, but it's going to get better, you know. And even if, it, if it's a child, you know, you can certainly relate your childhood, if it's an adult, you can relate your adult, yeah. you know, adulthood, and, 
you know, I think some of the toughest challenges we see are patients who have a traumatic amputation, right? Because they're perfectly normal. One day. One day. And then something happens and it's often not their fault. Mm -hmm. And and if you compare that to somebody that has a vascular amputation or a tumor amputation, the writing is on the wall before mm -hmm. that day, right? Yep. So there's a mental process that this is coming, this is coming, this is coming, right? It doesn't mean you like it, it doesn't mean you accept it, it doesn't mean you don't think it's not fair, you know. But, but when you have a traumatic amputation, I am, I am, you know, normal or as normal as I think I'm you know, supposed to be one day and then the very next day, you know, a uh, course of action that you can't turn back. Those are some of the people or patients, I should say, including myself, that have this disbelief. I can't believe I'm in this position. I can't believe this happened. I can't believe somebody, you know, da 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 da, whatever, you know. And, and those are the folks, and myself included, that have a tougher time adjusting but you know it's a it's a matter of time and you know I feel uh, drawn to help those people through this process I mean I've had patients that were so angry I mean angry enough to you know really angry yeah. you know not healthy angry and then you just have to kind of be patient with them and then come around and they say okay yeah you're right thank yeah. you you know and those are that's why I do this that's my the relationship part of this yeah. is why I do this I love working with a patient for 20 years. It's relationship-based, it's not transactional. Yep. You know, we get to know them, what they want to do, what they want to accomplish. That's what life's about. I'm a prosthetist, orthotist. So prosthetics is the field of replacing a missing body part. And orthotics is the field of providing a device that supports or corrects an existing body part. So the best example would be a, a prosthesis is an artificial limb. And it can be a, a, an upper extremity or a hand prosthesis. It can be a lower extremity prosthesis. Orthotics is any kind of brace from head to toe. It can be a neck brace if you, you know, injure your neck in an injury or have a, a degenerative process. It can be a back brace, a knee brace, a foot brace, or you know, anywhere in between. So that's the field orthotics as well. Most prostheses are the same endoskeletal design. In other words, the pieces and the parts that look rather mechanical. And then you can put a cosmetic cover over the top. Um, and those can be kind of basic or they can be very nice. And you can, you can, you can spend a lot of money on a yeah. custom silicone that really looks nice. Um, probably one of the transitions of my lifetime as an amputee is that, you know, when I was young, every prosthesis was finished to look like a limb, you know. Um, and um, maybe people didn't wear shorts as much. They didn't embrace their prostheses as much. And, and that has changed so much really? over my life. Oh my gosh. We probably do not do covers on the majority of our limbs. People embrace their prostheses. People, you know, the society is more accepting of it or, or like the way it looks. You see a, a lot more unfinished, or I'm gonna say uncovered, um, prosthetics these days. The running feet be absolutely no reason to put a cover on that, right. you know, you know, but there's the the prosthetic designs that have come about in the, my <laughs> almost 50 years as an amputee is, is, is night and day, you know, is it technology. Really? Oh my gosh, it's just crazy. I, I, I had I had the wooden leg, you know, yeah. with hinges on the outside that could be door hinges and you know rubber foot and you know now I've got a prosthesis that has a computer in the knee and a foot that's got you know a lot of uh, spring in return that allows me to you know walk faster or run or you know do, th do the things that um, that I want to do. The thing I tell patients is you know we, we can't get yesterday back. Yesterday is gone and we can think about it or we can talk about it or we can you know but all that's a waste of time. You know we, we can't change yesterday. So you got to decide you know what are you going to do with tomorrow? How, how is, how is, what's tomorrow going to be like for you? How, how do you want it to be? You know, and have a positive attitude about it. The sooner the patients do that, understand that, embrace it, the healthier and more productive and better off they are with their, with their prostheses for sure. After all these years, do you still know you don't have a real leg? You know, that's a good question. I, I, when I go to sleep at night and I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or something, I don't have to think 
is my leg there or not? I know that it's not, right? So that's one part of that question. Um, I think I ambulate pretty good with my prosthesis. You see, sometimes when I see myself in a video, I'm like, come on, Tom, you can do a little bit better than that. But that feels perfectly normal to me, you know. And of course, there's, you know, terrain or carrying things, or whatever can all exacerbate that, um, you know, whatever gait deviation you, you may have or whatnot. But um, so uh, it, it's twofold on that question. You know, no, I don't think I have a leg there. But 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 walking with a prosthesis is perfectly normal to me. You know that that feels like my norm there. Tell us about the farm on Concord Road with the silos because people are going to love what you're going to tell them. There's two Martin farms right. on Concord Road. The farm uh, with the harvest stores um, was the farm where my father, Foster Martin, and my uncle, Billy Martin, farmed together for right. a while. Um, and Billy Martin continued to run that farm for a long time. Um, at some point in the late 70s, um, they went their separate paths and some more property on Concord Road. My dad established a dairy. Um, and so uh, I lost my dad in September. You know, that's 150 acres right. on Concord Road. It's in the middle of suburbia. Yep. And, you know, Paul, if I had a dollar for every person that's called us, you know, asking us if we're ready to sell, sell out, yeah. you know, we could go have a pretty nice steak dinner. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're not selling out. We're, we're moving there. We're going to remodel the farmhouse. We're cleaning the farm up. And we're, you know, we have a wheat crop planted right there. So um, it's a small wheat crop, but it's a wheat crop planted yeah. right there on Concord Road in the middle of suburbia. And, you know, we're going to keep it that way as long as we can. I know we're going to keep it for this generation. I'm pumping the next generation about the opportunity to do that as well. Good for you. Good on behalf of all of us that enjoy going down that road and enjoying the pond and the cows and the, and the fence and everything else. It's just a, an asset to the community. Well, thank you. We aim to, to keep it that way as long as we can. Brought to you by the folks at Anderson County.